Thank you very much, Professor Hodgson. Um, I would like to invite both of the speakers to step forward so that we can have questions of both. Yes, if you have a question, um, perhaps you could put your hand up and um, we could bring you a microphone. Thank you both for wonderful papers. Um, my uh, question or is for Peter. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if you might illumine the connection between Hegel, Marx, and uh, Martin Luther King, if you see any. I'm particularly asking about a letter I remember studying some years ago from Karl Marx to Abraham Lincoln, in which he said that he was asked by Lincoln about the emancipation of the slaves. And Karl Marx said, it's not time. The uh, freedom has not ripened to that point in the United States by me, and by that he meant that he was not aware of abolitionism, Karl Marx, but he thought that freedom had to ripen by finding expression from the elite, the intellectual elite had to articulate it before it could uh, fully be manifest in uh, history. Do you, do you see any thread f through Hegel, through your Hegel stuff, through Karl Marx into King? Uh, wonderful question. Well, Hegel is actually a part of my uh, full paper, uh, not Marx. But uh, I think Marx's uh, uh, comment is very interesting, and I had I'd never uh, heard that particular uh, report. <clears throat> um, I think it's, it, in a sense, it is a, a kind of Hegelian insight that uh, freedom has to ripen. There needs to be a, a maturing process. But the thing is uh, that the, the ripening process doesn't simply happen in a, in a regular, steady, uh, predictable way. It, it, it happens by breakthroughs. And uh, Hegel actually has this concept of breakthroughs. And I think the Civil Rights Movement was actually one of those breakthroughs in which uh, the issue was, was forced. Uh, forced in a way and at a point that this country was not ready, supposedly. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the university at which I taught uh, for most of my career, <clears throat> uh, Vanderbilt University, uh, went through a, 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 a very serious uh, crisis in 1960, just a few years before I joined the faculty, um, when uh, one of the uh, students in the Divinity School, uh, James Lawson, became a leader of the Nashville sit-in movement. <clears throat> and Lawson, as you know, was a uh, disciple not only of, of Martin Luther King, but also of Gandhi, <clears throat> as was uh, King himself. And as a consequence of uh, Lawson's involvement in, this, uh, in, in the, in the sit-in movement, the deliberate breaking of the laws, segregation laws, et cetera, uh, the Board of Trust expelled him from the university. <clears throat> And that uh, caused an internal crisis in the university that went on for several months. <clears throat> and, what, and part of the pathos of the, of the, of the whole situation um, was that the, uh, the, the chancellor of, of, of the university at that time, uh, Harvey Branscombe, was, uh, had a plan to integrate Vanderbilt University. But the time had not quite come yet. The intellectuals hadn't weren't, weren't ready. 
but it, it was going to unfold in, 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 in gradual stages, in, admitting a few students at a time. Civil, the civil rights movement came along, the sit-in movement, it forced it, everything broke open. But that's how things happen in history. And uh, you would think that somebody like, like Marx would appreciate that. Uh, I haven't said much about Hegel, but, uh, but, uh, uh, but Luther plays a very important role for Hegel. Um, because Luther is the one who sort of uh, uh, is, is the first uh, uh, great uh, uh, figure to articulate in early modernity uh, what uh, uh, Hegel called the Germanic principle, which is essentially the European principle, the, the principle of subjectivity, uh, the, the articulation and discovery of the of the free and responsible subject who stands over and against uh, external authority. And uh, for Luther on, on Hegel's interpretation, this all comes through his, his interpretation of the Christian gospel and the role of Christ. <clears throat> and the way in which um, uh, God is present, not through the uh, external authority and institutional structures, but through the inner witness of the spirit and the presence of Christ in the in the in the Eucharistic fellowship. <clears throat> um, so Luther becomes really the the um, uh, sort of the modern prophet of freedom uh, for for Hegel. But uh, the immediate consequence of Luther's Reformation was a an extended period of religious war. <clears throat> Of, uh, of, of, of turmoil and controversy within Europe. And because, uh, and Hegel also says that his insight was not speculatively comprehended or internalized. Uh, that is to say, the, the, the true meaning, of the true significance of what he accomplished was not, was, was not adequately comprehended. And so a, a period of, of Protestant orthodoxy and reaction set in on the one hand, and then the emergence of modern uh, atheistic secularism on the other hand, because of a, of, of a failure to, 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 to achieve um, full rational insight into the meaning of, of, of Luther's Reformation. So Luther, too, then, is a somewhat ambiguous figure in the history of freedom. Well, I've, that's a, a kind of a rambling response to your question, which is, I think, a very interesting one. Maybe you would like to comment on it, Christo. Yeah, okay. <coughs> I'm not sure about this question, but um, I was just wondering, you, you talked about names, uh, about uh, Luther's self-naming, uh, in other words, his figuring of himself as, as something other than what he m might have been or what he might have wished to be, and, uh, and then Martin Luther King's as well. And, uh, and I'm wondering about the status, perhaps with regard to the question of in, uh, individualism that uh, Professor Serenin uh, uh, addressed, uh, of, uh, of this double self-stylization of Martin Luther and Martin Luther King through the act of naming and, uh, uh, and sort of the willful subjectivity and also the hubris uh, uh, in those acts and, and where that uh, hubris, if you would agree that, that there was some hubris in it in both cases, um, uh, how, how that plays out in, uh, in what the two of them were uh, attempting. Is that clear enough? Yeah. Uh. Yes, I would like to hear Risto's thoughts about this too. Uh, I think there is a there was a kind of hubris, or um, a, at least a kind of self-celebration uh, on the part of, you know, I don't know whether the, I, I assume that's a true story. I mean, I read it in Martin Marty's book about Luther, <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's all, it's almost too good to be true, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I assume there is a, there is some basis for it, and he and he he did change his <clears throat> the spelling of his name. <clears throat> Maybe you could hand me that water. 
Uh, What's the reason? I don't, I'm not quite sure why why he why he changed the spelling. Maybe simply to, to uh, it was a it was a more it was a more natural pronunciation in German, Luther, rather than Luder. But well, Luder also has very negative connotations. Oh, it does. Oh, okay. Well, that that undoubtedly explains it. <laughs> um, in the case of, of Martin Luther King, of course, it was his father, his father's hubris, that sort of, uh, in effect, um, going with his own father rather than his own mother, the rebellion of the son against the, the mother in this case. Maybe you could read some sort of Oedipal <laughs> overtones into that. Uh, and then, but then finding this name useful. I'm sure he, might, he found it useful. And then his son also ultimately found the name useful. And it's, it's curious to me that, that there's virtually no literature on this. I think it's a fascinating question. I've often wondered about the name of Martin Luther King. And uh, I agreed to do this paper uh, partly because it gave me a chance to try to find some answers. <laughs> you have any thoughts? Yeah, concerning Luther's name, it's, it's of, of course, the fact that he was born Luder and then at the university he started to call himself with names Luther and Eleutherios, so it's kind of gr Greek versions of the, Of course it was common at that time to take Latin or Greek names for, as university students, but definitely it has a kind of kind of ideological meaning also, but, but, but I uh, just give brief reflection on this concept of freedom. This is for me has always been one of the most difficult topics in, in Luther's studies, the notion of freedom, because at least from a modern viewpoint, Luther's writings are, are in so many ways unsatisfactory or, or, or problematic because, because the, the, on the one hand, one can say that this is a wonderful dialectic that, that you have freedom of a Christian and then a couple of years later that you deny free will. But if you, if you really want to make sense of it, it's extremely difficult. And, and for instance, this De Servo Arbitrio, Bondits of the Will, so many bad studies have written about it, but I haven't really seen any really good study which would explain. And it's, it's I think it's... Uh, you, you um, if I remember you right, so, so my, my big problem in the servoir, but you has always been that there is not only the omnipotence of God, but omni activity of God, so that God is taking care of everything, so, so that there is this web of, uh, web of omni activity which seems to predestine ev everything. But on the other hand, then Luther can say in this same treatise that he affirms the so-called natural openness of human being to receive God's things. And he also affirms the so-called freedom in inferior things. And he also admits the, the, the cooperation with grace. So, 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 so in this web of omni-activity or predestination, so there are at least three big holes somehow, somehow which also um, seem to undermine his uh, rhetoric of, of predestination, but how, how to make that somehow understandable is, a, is an extremely difficult issue. I'd like to uh, um, share with everyone that I'm a congregationalist minister that really loves Martin Luther. And uh, um, to borrow something from Jonathan Edwards, which I think kind of helps perhaps the question of predestination, is that Edwards talked about in, uh, the motive. First, the motive must be freed before the will acts. And I think that if you understand that when man's motive, Luther said in the bondage of the will that we, that man is a dead statue, and that um, we cooperate with grace, or we cooperate with God, not because we're, we're because we are the first cause of that, but that our motive has been changed, where we see now that we are we freely wish to, we freely wish to, which is the, our motive, which has now been changed by a divine act of grace. We are now motivated 
to come to God. Uh, and I'm uh, about the, see, God, I believe, now this is my understanding, the God is the first cause, but God is also ordained secondary causes. I don't believe Luther, you know, I, I believe it's incorrect to think that Luther just had a, uh, didn't believe in secondary causes, because he did, and so did Calvin. Both of them believed in secondary causes. Uh, but um, I think that uh, the concept of freedom, you know, we're free, yes, we're free, but we, we as Christians, we are free to go back under the lordship of Christ again, which is a self-imposed um, self slavery in a sense, if, you're, if you understand what I'm saying. So there is paradox, you know, there always will be paradox in Scripture, uh, but I find it very interesting and refreshing that you brought up the concept of freedom and predestination and the will of man and the will of God. It's a very fascinating subject, and I appreciate that. Just to say briefly, I, I also think much on those lines, and a fairly good recent study by Robert Kolb on bound choice also goes into the same direction and saying that there is not just predestination, but also this affirmation of, let's say, secondary causality. And Luther uses also causa secunda in, in some of his later, later writings. And maybe the, the theological problem then is that this is more or less the view of Erasmus also, because all of non-Pelagian Western theology thinks on those lines. So, so, the, so if this is the case, then, then there is not the real difference to er, Erasmus. Uh, I think the, the problem is part, in part is that the, the, the conceptuality and the categories that were inherited by Luther and indeed by the whole of, I mean, this is not just Luther's problem. This is a problem that goes back to the very beginnings of the history of theology and, he, and of course into scripture itself. <clears throat> Although scripture is perhaps a little bit more adequate in that it tends to think more metaphorically and poetically about these questions and perhaps not so much in Aristotelian categories of causality, but I think the, 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 the whole categorial framework is inadequate to the problem. I think that and it, it's 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 a it's a it's a prehistorical non-organic way of thinking about how God relates to the world. And Luther was unable to break out of that categorical framework. I mean, he was revolutionary in many ways. I mean, this may be a, a, a gross misinterpretation, but I think, in terms of some of these basic theological problematics, he doesn't really uh, break through very much. And I think uh, really only, only uh, uh, later do possibilities, new possibilities emerge for rethinking this whole very difficult question of how divine freedom and human freedom, how God and history relate to each other in such a way that God is, is efficacious but not an absolute sovereign, mm -hmm. in some way a participant, uh, but one whose participation does indeed, is indeed profoundly effective. That's a very difficult question, one that we struggle with. I struggle with. This is a question for Professor Sarn, and I'm over here, <laughs> sorry. Um, you, you mentioned that you were skating out on some thin ice regarding Luther and human sexuality, so I'd like to push you out on the thin ice a little further, if I may. Um, do you see, I, I was very interested in, in, in your take on this, and so I, I just want to ask for a clarification. Do you see Luther as being, um, was he talking about human sexuality as such, in terms of retaining this kind of Augustinian approach, or was he, is there a gender difference here? Uh, the, the quotation that you, that you gave was from Luther talking about his own sexuality, about male sexuality and how it's uncontrollable. Do you think he would have said the same about female sexuality? Yeah, that's a good question, and that's a good question. O of course, one first thing to say is that Luther is, is living in a patriarchal society. But uh, if I remember right, he is also speaking of, of female sexuality. And of course, this is this old medieval topic of, of 
of fulfilling the marital obligations, which means that, that, that both spouses have sexual needs and it is the marital duty to somehow fulfill, which ascribes this kind of active sexuality to both partners in marriage. And at least in that sense, uh, I, I think one, one can speak on, on, on that there is no real sex difference in, in this respect. Um, about uh, 45 years ago, I began to uh, <clears throat> be a student of Karl Barth. And I would like to think that I, I loved him and love him still, reading him right now. I would like to think that I've gotten a little beyond Karl Barth uh, in a way that maybe he would approve of. And um, Karl Barth tried to solve the problem of predestination by rebuilding Calvin's uh, doctrine of predestination. And he did so by saying that uh, it was Christ who was predestinated. Christ was predestinated from, from before the foundation of the world to be our savior, and in him we were predestinated. Now, um, I would suggest that right there is the answer to the, um, the falling apart of sovereignty and freedom, because it would take um, uh, the almighty God, and no less, to predestinate his son to be free. And this would uh, cast light on um, uh, why uh, Jesus says, the truth shall make you free. And if the son makes you free, you are free indeed. Um, if we go back to uh, Genesis, we don't really have to see man as by nature free. It can be the word, you see, which frees man. Uh, but I would, um, I would like to sum up my suggestion. I said I hoped I'd gone beyond Karl Barth. Um, both of you speakers um, hardly, if one of you not at all, the other just a little bit referred to faith in Christ. You skated it over very, very lightly. Well, Luther did the same thing. He wrote a, a thing called the encomium on all, on all his works, which was to be the preface to his collected works. And in it, he uh, uh, explained the, the, um, his prophecy, the prophecy of Habakkuk, the righteous shall live by his faith, without one word of reference to Christ. But my suggestion is, what if the righteous who should live by his faith was Jesus, as Hans Kung suggested? Then, you see, there would be no problem. He would be free. And he would be free by the, by the simple word of righteousness that God spoke from the foundation of the world. He who by faith is righteous shall live. This, was, this is the sum of the law, according to Rabbi Simlai and according to Qumran. So the entire law summed up in these five words. And Paul, by the way, Paul said, if I speak five words in the church, I am more than 10,000 words. I believe those five words were, were in Greek, hodikaios ek pistios zesetai, the, the uh, righteous by faith shall live. So that would be... Uh, righteousness is all, the almighty God and freedom. Well, that may solve one problem, but create other problems. Uh, I mean, and of course, Bart also modified uh, the doctrine of predestination into universal election. All are elected in Christ. God does not will or determine that some will be damned forever, but wills the election of all in Christ. <clears throat> and that's in part also uh, uh, Hegel's line. But, but the problem is that uh, what about those who stand outside the domain of Christ, as for example, the Jews or the Turks, to take the two 
principal examples that were present in, in Luther's day and also, of course, in ours as well. I mean, um, I don't think that the, that the Christocentric turn really provides a, a very satisfactory answer to the question of how God acts in history, in universal history. Um, I don't we have to say that, um, that God, uh, that there are, that, that God acts through not a single, but, but a plurality of, of, of instrumentalities, of figures, of, 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 sag of, of paradigmatic uh, figures and events. And that the attempt to reduce these to a, to a single denominator uh, represents an, a, 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 another perhaps a, a more subtle form of imperialism. I think this issue is going to come up later in the conference, isn't it, as we talk about Luther in relation to other religions. Um, does that, I, I'm not sure that that's, that's not a very direct answer to your, to your question. Um, do you have anything? No, I quite agree with you. Yeah. Okay. Did, oh, you want to come back? Excuse me. I had a question or, or a comment about, um, I was at the Spurtis Museum for a lecture, and there was a rabbi who did a revision, I don't remember the name of the book, of, of Martin Luther to say that Martin Luther was really a friend to the Jews and much of the criticism about his anti-Semitism um, in this man's new book that was just being published, um, he tried to clarify to say that when uh, Luther was criticizing um, Jewish people, what he was talking or speaking of was people who had fallen away from the word, from studying the word, and that um, that you know the people of Israel who were the chosen people were the chosen people, and that Luther was, um, you know, chastising the fallen away people more than just Jews in general. And I think this goes with the German cultural thing also, in the sense that, um, you know, Goldhagen's book from Princeton that every German is guilty of anti-Semitism, and every person um, who's a Lutheran. Was anti-Semit, you know, Semitic. I mean, people who went to German Lutheran schools, bricks were thrown at them around the turn of the century. In Chicago, names were changed from English from German into English. And at this conference, I would, you know, I'd like to see, uh, or maybe you would answer the question, you know, why is there not more scholarship on revising some of the notions of global anti-Semitism? and blaming it on Luther and whatever, Germany. You, you go to the Spurtis Museum and they show a history going all the way mm. back to BC. You know, it didn't just start with Luther in 1940, so maybe you could comment on that. Or your question, you, you kept speaking of the Jews and the Turks, which is to me an oversimplification. Of course, this is a very important issue and if we if we look at the name of Martin Luther and ask people from all countries of the world, this anti-Semitism is one of the issues with which people who don't know anything else of Luther sometimes know. And, and, and that therefore, in particular, when discussing the global Luther, this is an extremely important issue. It's not easy to revise uh, this prevailing view because for, for many reasons. I, I mean, uh, to put it very briefly, I think it, it was, many Luther scholars actually think so that in his earlier writings, Luther was hoping that the Jews would somehow adhere to Protestant faith or adhere to Reformation. And, and, and he even wrote a book underlining that Jesus was born as a Jew in, in the in incarnation. But, when, he's, when he was disappointed in this fairly exaggerated hope, so the Jews did not pay attention. So then he, uh, in his later writings, became very anti-Semitic. I think this is a, 
partial explanation historically, but it is of course no excuse of anything. So you cannot alleviate the burden which Luther has. And, and another reason, historical background is, this is uh, in Heiko Obermann's book, Roots of Antisemitism, where he, where he argues also that this is a very common phenomenon in early modern Europe. So, so antisemitism, so Luther was no worse than many other his contemporaries. But this is also not an excuse. So, so if others are as bad as he, so he is not excused by that. So, so, so there are so many traps when you are when you are trying to. But it's also true what I think you, what you heard this person in a museum saying that Jews are also exemplifying in, in biblical expositions of Luther. They are ex exemplifying the apostasy or falling away of faith in general. So, and this is this is a kind of very abstract notion. It does not uh, refer to ethnicity. But, but also to say this is a kind of ambivalent because, because it's nevertheless the Jews who are metaphorically used for this broader. So, so it's very difficult to alleviate this burden. So I think many scholars have somehow tried it, but, but normally people are trying to give these historical explanations and then uh, saying that this does not alleviate the burden or, or a hypothetic which Lutherans have in this respect. I think we have time for one more question and there was a hand up over here. Hi, my question has to do with um, how Luther is received in, as, as a, the sort of the first modern. And Professor Cern, and your, um, your readings seem to be somewhat polemical against the kind of major way of reading Luther that goes probably through Hegel uh, which is Luther as uh, inaugurating the sort of ontological problematic of interiority, so the you know, innerlichkeit, uh, mm. the, sort of that organizes Hegel's reading of Luther, and it's a very influential one, I think. Mm. Um, and you seem to be quite polemical against that way of receiving Luther. Could you say more about uh, about your relation to that problematic within Luther's text? Yeah, that's a good question, but but not easy to easy to answer. You are completely right that I I I was kind of putting forward a claim that I don't like to relate Luther too much to Kierkegaard or this Hegelian notion as a kind of birth of interiority or subjectivity. So um, so maybe maybe I have just to give you kind of very simple and external re reasons. So I. I we have in, in, in Finland in latest 20, 30 years have had a particular school of Luther interpretation or a type of Luther interpretation which, which is somehow critical to the existentialist or subjectivist's reading of readings of Luther and more inclined to interpret in terms of sometimes we say ontology but, but also 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 so um, I'm saying that Luther is not so much forerunner of modernity, so there are more modern spirits, maybe Erasmus was more forerunner of modernity than, than Luther, so, 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 uh, or, or maybe some Machiavelli or Ignatius de Loyola, so to take some contemporaries rather than, than Luther. Uh, so uh, this is completely right interpretation. The other thing is that I am somewhat influenced by Charles Taylor's work, so on this affirmation of ordinary life, which gives a new twist. I, I mean also for, for professional Luther scholars that you can somehow see Luther as a forerunner of modernity without falling into Hegelian or Kierkegaardian traps of individualism, subjectivity, and, and I, I, I find this line very promising somehow. We can take um, counsel. Oh, yeah. No, I just wanted. I just wanted to comment. Is this off? No. Okay, it's on. Um, I think it's wrong to. Uh, well, uh, uh, I have a question first of all, and and that is whether it wouldn't be possible to to balance these two senses. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, the 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 turn to the uh, to the subject. On the other hand, the turn to the common life or the ordinary life. 
they aren't necessarily mutually exclusive, and perhaps Luther contributes to both of them. Um, but I think the Hegelian view uh, doesn't really stress so much the aspect of individual autonomy. It's really more a matter of, of subjectivity of, and, and of inwardizing, uh, taking responsibility for, uh, for the, how should I put it, the way in which the grace of God and the, and the saving power of God is mediated or presented in the world, not through these sort of external, institutional, sometimes almost mechanical structures, but it's, it's, it's something that happens, in, but it brings about an inward transformation. Uh, so there really is an ontological change. Uh, it's, a, it, it's a real participation in Christ, but it's not principally individualistic for Hegel. It's, it's really, Hegel has a very communal understanding of freedom, and in that respect it occurs, I believe, Hegel says that it's very important that Luther married because that was Luther's way of, of sanctifying co ordinary life, common life, and of, in a sense, critiquing the, the notion of the, uh, the, that, the, that the monastic or the priestly way is the only Christian way. Yeah. Okay, we are dealing with issues that have been with us for centuries, and I don't think they will go away in the next two days. Fortunately, we will have more chance to discuss them. Let us thank both of our speakers and then proceed to the reception.